All right. My name is Caroline Mahaki, and I'm going to be talking to you about brucellosis control among agropastoralists in Tanzania. My focus will be on how to communicate risk effectively. To begin with, brucellosis has been determined to be endemic in sub-Saharan Africa, and it is a high priority disease in Tanzania. So there are many efforts to control brucellosis in Tanzania. On the other hand, uh, brucellosis is the incidence of brucellosis is higher in pastoralist and agropastoralist contexts, and this is related to their consumption of raw animal source foods, as well as their the way they handle their animals and the way they, they interact very closely with their livestock. And therefore, they have to be involved as key stakeholders in the control of brucellosis. On the other hand, there's the aspect of risk perception. What people make of a certain risk for disease, for example, in terms of its prevalence, in terms of its severity, in terms of how common that risk occurs, will determine the kind of pre preventive and control efforts they are willing to take or not willing to take up. And sometimes you might find that uh, the risk perception of professionals will be different from the risk perception of communities, and this will affect community sensitization and what, whether people are willing to take up those control strategies or not. The objective of this study, therefore, what the objectives of this study, therefore, were to identify the risk perceptions of the agro-pastoralist communities in relation to animal handling and consumption of raw animal products, as well as to determine the effective community engagement strategies. So first, we wanted to understand what their perceptions about animal source foods, raw animal source foods, as well as animal handling is concerned and in terms of disease, in this case, brucellosis. And secondly, to identify what would be the best ways to communicate to them in a way that is likely to lead to long-term behavior change. This study was conducted in three villages in Kilombero district in Tanzania. These three villages neighbored each other. It was an ethnography, so I lived in this community for six months. And through these six months, I was able to conduct a survey with almost all the agropastoralist households in the three villages. And I was also able to do focus group discussions, in-depth interviews, key informant interviews, and also many informal interviews, as well as a lot of observation. So I not only just heard from what they told me in the interviews, but also observed their actual behavior. And this study was conducted in 2019, between March and August. The results of this study show, first of all, that brucellosis is largely unknown. Many of the, the pastoralists and agro-pastoralists had never heard of brucellosis, and only 7.2% of them had ever heard of brucellosis in livestock. On the other hand, when we asked them whether they had observed symptoms of brucellosis in their animals, including abortions, retained placenta, infertility, stillbirths, many of, some of them had actually observed those symptoms but they did not consider them to be a big problem. First of all, this was related to the other livestock diseases in their context, which they felt were a much bigger priority than these other symptoms that they had witnessed of brucellosis. On the other hand, even when they observed the symptoms, they did not know what caused them. And sometimes they thought that some of them thought that they attributed them to supernatural factors. And this is because many of these symptoms were reproductive health challenges which they compared to what happens in humans. So they said, even for humans, you will find stillbirths, you will find infertility, and so it was attributed to God, that God decides who gives birth, God decides which animals live and which ones die. So it wasn't really considered to be a big issue. When it comes to the issue of retained placenta, they had ways that they felt that they were able to extract the placenta, and so it wasn't really a, a difficult challenge for them. On the other hand, this particular context, Having owning a large herd of animals was more important than the individual productivity of each animal. So they were willing to retain animals that were not necessarily productive just to have a large herd and for sentimental value. For example, for infertile animals, they would say that those animals became very big and they were beautiful to look at. So for that reason, they were willing to retain them in the herd and maybe sell them at a much later date or slaughter them in the home when there was a function. So they still retain those kind of animals for other value not necessarily monetary value value or productive value. On the other hand, even for those who had heard about brucellosis or knew even brucellosis risk factors, they did not change their behavior. 
and they were willing to continue taking raw milk, consuming raw milk, or uh, assisting animals in parturition with bare hands, or handling aborted material with bare hands, because it wasn't really a big, it wasn't really a risk factor for disease. So they had heard about it, but they didn't believe that you can actually get sick from consuming raw milk, or from assisting your animal, or staying very close to your animal. On, on the other hand, sensitization activities were usually conducted. So they said, for example, when they went to a health facility for women, a child welfare clinic, they would be told don't give raw milk to your child. Or when somebody had TB, they would be told do not take raw milk because that is how you get TB. But they did not feel that this kind of sensitization activities were actually addressing their questions, their doubts, and their uncertainties. So for example, they would say, we know many people who do not take raw milk, but they are getting many diseases. Or we know some people who have never consumed raw milk or communities that don't take raw milk, but they are still getting TB. So they had those kind of questions which they felt that they never had, they didn't often have an opportunity to ask. Like when women went to the clinic, they were not able to ask these questions to nurses. Or when there was a community baraza, they were not able to ask these questions to the practitioners in a way that they felt that their questions were being responded to. And that was a big challenge for them in terms of adopting new practices or beginning to change their behavior, for example, beginning to boil milk. In this regard, therefore, we found that there was a disparity in the risk perception of professionals and that of the community. So for the professionals, they of course they already knew that consumption of our raw animal source foods, residing with livestock, and many of these other risk factors was a big challenge in terms of controlling brucellosis. But for the community, they did not believe that those practices could actually make you sick from brucellosis or any other disease for that matter. And the reason is because these practices were rooted in, in tradition. This was their culture. It was actually part of who they are. And there were many other benefits that they attributed to these practices, especially to raw milk consumption. For example, they said raw milk is more nutritious they said raw milk is more beneficial for children, especially when they are young, because of that nutritional value. They also said that raw milk helps to counteract any poisonous substances so that if you ingest anything that is not good for you, then and take raw milk, then it will counteract that action and you will be okay. They also said that there were also practical reasons why that prevented them from boiling milk. For example, women said that they were overworked and so boiling milk was an extra chore that they were not willing to take up. Men said consuming raw milk when they're in the forest, had looking after the animals, is much more effective and more time-saving. So they do not want to go through that whole process of boiling milk and waiting for it to cool down before they can drink it and start their journey. On the other hand, there is a need for focus and long-term community engagement. So the way this kind of engagement was done, it was often done in a very haphazard manner. So it wasn't focused in the sense that it was not addressing the real issues in the community. And on the other hand, it was not targeting specific problems or specific questions that the communities had. On the other hand, this kind of engagement also was not long term. It was usually erratic. So once in a while. So like they would say, when we had a Ritivali fever outbreak, they, we heard on the radio that you should not be taking raw milk. But it was not a long-term kind of thing that would make them think about it and begin to, to, to process this information and to begin to question the kind of behavior that they were engaging in. So it wasn't, in that case, therefore, they didn't feel that it was so effective in their context. In conclusion, therefore, these are the things that they proposed. First of all, they felt that for community engagement to be very relevant and to be very um, accepted by them, it needs to be culturally sensitive. They felt that in many cases, people who came to communicate to them used a very patronizing attitude, or they did not understand their culture and they were not willing to listen to that this is part of who we are. So it, it, the way the message came across to them was not respectful and therefore they were not willing to listen to it. So like for women, they would say, when you go to a health facility and the nurses talk to us this way, we will just nod in agreement, but you're not planning to do, to change our behavior or to even consider what they are telling us. But if they were more culturally sensitive, like listening to us, trying to understand our rationale behind this behavior, then there might be dialogue and we might be more willing to listen to them. Secondly, they propose that this information needs to be targeted. 
it needs to be very targeted to their specific questions or specific doubts. So instead of this information being very general and broad, it needs to be specific. Like I said, there are questions that they have, and these are the questions they want answered. And so when professionals come to them, not just talking down to them and telling them you need to do this and stop doing that, but asking them what is it about raw milk that you value? Or why is it that you're having challenges with boiling milk? Then that way they will be more willing to consider taking up those new behavior and taking up those new practices. On the other hand, it needs to be dynamic. The way it has been done in the past is usually like call a community baraza, in which case in this context, it is men who will attend. But they are proposing it needs to be dynamic so that you are involving children in schools. This education is being passed to children in schools. It's being passed to women, to herders, to men. And that way, when it is so broadly done and when it is catering for many people, then everybody will hear this message and maybe now the community can begin to examine it and to start thinking of a long-term behavior change. Even if they don't change now, it can lead to long-term behavior change. And lastly, it needs to be continuous. So that it's not just a one-off kind of thing, but it needs to be done repeatedly over and over and over again. Because that way, when they, they said that the more they keep hearing this message, the more they are likely to consider it. But if they hear it once in a while, then to them it communicates that it's not really that important. But if they hear it more and more, like they give the example of HIV, the way the, the messaging has been done, it's done so many times that people are now willing to consider it and start thinking about it. And that is what they propose would eventually lead to long-term behavior change and that might start to help some of the brucellosis control strategies that are being employed in this particular context. Because even if we what to start doing vaccination or anything else like that, the community still needs to own it and to still accept this kind of control. Lastly, these are the two publications so far from this work and you can look at them and they would give further insights. And lastly, I want to acknowledge the following individuals for supporting this study. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, Carol, uh, for keeping time and also for a very interesting and engaging uh, presentation. Uh, for me, it was very interesting to see the footer of your slides that said uh, involve communities, information is not enough. And I think you've uh, uh, highlighted the facts that we need to be looking at when we are engaging communities and how it needs to be done, being cultural sensitive at certain levels, ensuring that we are not condescending or looking down on them, but addressing the real and felt issues.